Hello, my name is Chris Rakowenzi. I'm an indigenous youth from the Chippewas and Awash, located at Neyashinaming, Ontario. And I hope you enjoy my film, A Tegemeg and Ice. Thank you. My name is Chris Rakowenzi. I'm from the traditional territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, which is located on what is known as the Bruce Peninsula. Ontario, Canada. The Saugi Ojibwe people have depended on the resource of fish and the waters to provide food, culture, and economics needed to survive since time immemorial. I come from a fishing family, and fishing has been an important part of our lives and our livelihood. My parents owned and operated a sustainable fishing business selling native fish at local markets around the area. Over the last decade, however, we have noticed the impacts of climate change on fish populations, especially Lake Whitefish. Andrew Akwenzi, I'm from the Chippewas and Awash, sustainable commercial fisherman. My name is Natasha Akwenzi, I'm from Naxuo First Nation, living at Naya Shinaming with my husband and sons. Now our main catch is uh, a dick meg, uh, whitefish, and that uh, it's uh, been in decline in the last little bit. Whitefish spawn in the fall on the shoals. They, they're not like other fish that travel upstream in rivers to spawn. They spawn in the rocks and the algae and the short grass that's out there and uh, use it as protection for their eggs. The ice forms slowly over the winter and offers more protection to their eggs and their young ones as they hatch very early in the spring from the wind and the wave action from being washed away and into the deeper waters where the predators can find them. Not been much ice cover over the last couple of years and that uh, it's been uh, very sporadic, not very uh, heavy and that uh, we get a thaw in January now and that that melts everything down. There hasn't been too many good things I can say with the climate change and that that has come our way for fishing and that I've had to shut my business down. The whitefish have uh, become more scarce. I remember our, my uncle and myself fishing just out over here and that uh, setting a, a net under the ice back in 75, 76, I believe it was. And that uh, it's, uh, it hasn't uh, iced up enough to be able to set nets under the ice safely anymore. In 2018, there was an order that was placed for 20 pounds of fish, one box of whitefish, one box of salmon. 10 pounds of each. Two months later, we were able to give her her 10 pounds of whitefish, and she never did receive her salmon. That was really unheard of for us. And we would cross it, and that the animals would be able to cross. Uh, now, uh, nowadays, uh, the ice barely forms pack ice comes in, pack ice goes out. It doesn't uh, get thick enough to do anything on. In early 2018, we started a not-for-profit group called Bogotawad Alliance, which means they set a net in the Anishinaabe Moen. It was to look at the whitefish decline and climate change. The other things that we have done with it is hosted many events, something like ribbon skirt making to shoreline cleanups to fishermen celebrations. Right now I'm currently working at the Fisheries Assessment Program as an Indigenous Ecological Knowledge Interviewer in my community. These interviews are focused towards the decline of Lake Whitefish, but also the fishermen and women stories that I'd like to share. Hey everyone, my name is Jessie Akalaya. I am a young Métis Dene from Talita NWT. Talita in our Dene language means where the two rivers meet or where the two waters meet. 
um, right here in the Satru region. And the reason I chose this spot to introduce myself is because I wanted to show um, the Mackenzie River um, joining the Great Bear River. And that's what Tuita means, is where the two rivers meet. For my video titled, This is What's Going to Happen, I think, I tried to keep the past coming into the present. As you've seen in the photos, all of our old timers are happily living on the land and not worried about climate change. Because at that time, you didn't have to worry about climate change. No one knew what it was, and everyone just lived in the bush and on the land. Nowadays, people struggle just trying to get to the bush and to their camps because you either have to take a different route due to climate change affecting. And what we see today is happening fast. It's change in weather, the plants, the animals, and everything around us. And as I talk about the past, I'm only talking about 40 years ago, and that's not long ago. So when I did the video, I wanted people to see what I'm talking about instead of me trying to explain it. I felt that would be a stronger message with visuals and from a youth. I also chose to focus on the moose skin boat in my video as well because all parts of making a moose skin boat are affected by climate change and we use all parts that come from the land. And I believe this change happening so fast is affecting our way of life as Dene people already. So I want to thank you in taking time to watch my video and learning what we as a Dene people are experiencing through this climate change. Thank you.
name is Emily McCallum. I am from Barrie, Ontario. I am 18 years old and a high school graduate. I am introducing my film called Will There Be Another Rainy Day? And it is about the lack of precipitation in my community. I hope you all like the movie and enjoy everybody else's films. Have you ever wondered what would happen if there was a lack of precipitation? The farm fields would get very dry and the crops wouldn't grow as big. There are many droughts in southern Canada, for example, there are many in the prairies. In 2016, there was a massive wildfire in Fort McMurray, which burnt approximately 1,450,000 acres of land. It also burnt 2,400 homes and buildings. This caused 80,000 people to flee northern Alberta and 500 species lost their home. In 2013, the southern Alberta flood had 100 millimeters of rain. This caused the Bow River to flood the streets of Calgary. This hit many towns and cities. In 2021, Northern Ontario had approximately 167 wildfires and burned 850,000 hectares. Lightning and very dry weather caused these fires. This is because of the lack of precipitation. An example of lack of precipitation can be found in a small village of Glen Huron. This ditch and spring used to have plenty of flowing water. Now, you can see there's hardly any water. With the lack of precipitation of rainfall and snow, this causes a drought in many lakes and rivers. For example, this water wheel has lost plenty of water to flow to rivers. With the lack of precipitation, this can cause many plants and flowers to die. Well, I'm a local resident here at Orr Lake. I've been here for 24 years. And I have to say, when I first moved up here, the levels of the lake were much higher. I would say about a foot higher. We had definitely northern pike here. Every spring they would come in to, to spawn. Now we see no pike. And we actually had a few years of carp coming in. Now we have no carp. So I'd have to say there's been a real change even in the quality of water. We're here near the largest aquifer of pure water in the world. But right now we used to be rated pure in winter, drinkable in summer. That's not true anymore. Well, I definitely have to say that we're probably getting some sort of acid rain, but I'm going to say also the weather has changed. We used to get a lot of snow in the winter. We're not getting as much snow. We used to get a bit of rain, a bit of sun, but now we're getting maybe a lot of rain and then three or four weeks of basically no rain at all. So the weather has changed. Sarah Black, I'm 26 years old and I'm a Yellowknife Stanley First Nation member from Northwest Territories, Canada. My video is about a giant mine that opened up in the area 70 years ago, which sparked the creation of Yellowknife. But they left 15 massive chambers filled with 237,000 tons of arsenic trioxide dust, highly water soluble, and it lives right beside one of Canada's largest freshwater lakes, which is enough to kill the world at least 10 times. And they're just trying to freeze it and forget about it, but we need to take it out of the ground. If it ever seeped into the mine and filled up those chambers, there would be no way to clean up. We used to drive right above the chamber. Now you see people walking around in like hazmat suits. And I'd like to thank Mark Terry for giving me this opportunity to share what the government left happen in this area. My people didn't know cancer before the mines opened, and it's sad to see the land in the shape that it's in now. So, thank you. Well, a billion now, I think, taxpayers' dollars. So you and your family and everybody else in this country is paying for this catastrophe that's happening up north. That's right. And I'll tell you why we have to take care of this site forever. 
biggest concern is arsenic, especially arsenic trioxide. One of, if not the most toxic forms of arsenic. A single teaspoon will kill a person, and there's 237,000 tons of it underground. They did the math for, and it could kill the world like 10 or 11 times over. Pretty much everyone is affected by it. It's almost like salt or flour. Water naturally drips steadily. So we have to pump this water out, treat it at the water treatment plant, and then we discharge it. That's we have to ensure that the water never touches the arsenic. And then it's a catastrophe after that. At C1 pit, this is the single greatest risk on site of Giant. It's literally just like an open bowl with a creek running next to it. If the creek were to ever overflow, it would fill up the underground and all the arsenic would get saturated. We'd all be doomed that arsenic dust would start washing away. But then it would start leaching tremendously. If the site were to ever be forgotten, and if water were ever to fill up the mine and it get into Great Slick Lake, it would drain into Mackenzie, which makes its way into Alberta, and then it could go up the Detcho, up into the Arctic Ocean. Right now, they pump it out before it fills up the mine. Even the cleanup that they're doing right now, it's just a temporary fix because they're just freezing preventing it from being mobilized. Permafrost is not intact. The miners have taken out the soil and all that kind of stuff and they dug and dug and dug. You need that overburden because that's your insulation. It affected the chambers from continuing to stay frozen and so that's the reason why they have to freeze it now. It doesn't just go away. The tailings are exposed and so the wind can take the dust and you'll find arsenic 25 kilometers away. The trees, the soil, and the plants, and the vegetation. There was rabbits that they sampled, and a lot of them had calcification on their bones. Something's not right, and they're being contaminated. There used to be a lot of smoke, though. The elders, I mean, like they did. They know the difference, you know, like they knew. But who do they talk to? They just have to talk among themselves. Winter time, when the boat comes this way, going to the snow, the chick eats snow, got sick and died. I think it was a dog, a handful of pus and stuff like that. Go shoot him. My dad used to sit his nits on the two islands here, and that's how he feed his dogs, right? We were getting fish right between Dilo and the giant line, and slowly the dogs started uh, dying. And you noticed the fish weren't the same. When you clean the fish, they see something. They know that that smoke lands somewhere, right? Way down to the lake, he saw ptarmigan. We we're gonna pluck it and start cooking it, but when he lifted up the feathers, it smoothly. It didn't look right. So I just prayed over it and then I put it in the house. But they've always said that it was safe, so everybody continued to swim, feed their dogs and things like that, how people died. They still say it's safe, but it's not safe. Once it's disturbed, the soil and everything, it's all... The very first time we got our arsenic testing for the kids was really high in their toenails. And that's, they were always outside. Every single day they were playing outside. You said you were always swimming there? Mm-hmm. Where? Like in that, like, you know where the um, um, ends right there? Mm -hmm. That's where they um, go. We're putting our heads under water and just like playing around splashing. Did you guys not to put your head under the water though? I could goggle. <laughs> and then after they get better, I get sick. And then we got called and she said, it's probably because you guys are eating too much fish. And I said, no, it can be because my kids don't like fish. Like a year later, I think, because we were living uptown by this point, we redid the testing and the arsenic levels for the kids all went down. And that's because they're not playing outside down here every day. Why when the doctors and the scientists had concerns all the way back in the late 1940s, things didn't really move until 1967, 1970. There was concern with the miners. They knew, the health officials, the government officials knew what was happening. But even before the death of the child, there was amongst residents a yelling concern. So you worked at Con Mine? Oh yeah, 19 years. I was a trackman, I was a blaster, cage standard, I was a hoistman, and the conditions of my health and everything else, it was all due to being mined in the dampness and everything else, my bones, and my age is 63.
it was in the water, leaching through the rock. And if you work the old side, a lot of my friends are gone because of the exposure we had to all kinds of stuff down there. They wouldn't admit to it, but that's exactly what was, you know, the arsenic. That's why there's a lot of uh, animals coming to town now, because they've got nothing for them to eat. They can't talk. We can see how they are surviving and what they are they're eating. Is it safe for them to eat here? Maybe I go to my cabin. I never see no bear, nothing. I never see no rabbit, nothing. You see be lost. He used to take snow from the back of the warehouse where there's no dogs around or this fresh snow just landed. Just to make tea. When you pull it in the cup, it's like oil, glossy. We have a warehouse. It used to be lots of raspberries. Nothing now. Nothing growing. This is a woman that washed her hair with the snow. They melted. They said the hair all fell off. That was not too good. Eating no berries. I've been hearing some elders tell stories about how that area used to be really, really beautiful. Mom, when she was little, and Grandma, they used to just go right across here and go berry picking. Our generation never got to experience my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just dead. Somebody growing here anymore. We need to be protecting the land and cleaning it up. You saw it on three separate occasions. Yeah. Blue sap. Blue sap. Never seen blue sap. Before. Who's gonna help us? Maybe you can cure cancer. <laughs> so Con yeah, turned their arsenic the into sludge. I don't know much about Con. I know. <laughs> That's the untold story.